As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're delighted to have a returning guest tonight, Brad Harris, founder and host of Sur- Full Spectrum Survival, is here with us back on Reluctant Preppers. Brad, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. We have had a hard time getting you on our production schedule for a couple of reasons, uh, one of which was that you uh, relocated. You moved your family from an uh, urban setting to a homestead. And later in this, in this interview, we'd like to, to uh, pick your brain a little bit about some of the uh, strategic planning that went into that for you, because we have a lot of our viewers who are contemplating similar possibilities to improve their resilience. And then some of the early lessons learned that you might be able to uh, share with us that have come out of that experience so far. I know it's still an unfolding drama because it's fresh. But the second sure. reason we had a hard time getting you is because you were hosting a, a uh, or participating in a major uh, conference and training session uh, this weekend. So we may get to ask you for some key takeaways uh, from that as well. But if we could uh, first hit on a couple of really hot stories that are in now finally breaking into the news. And that's part of the main reason I wanted to bring them up is, is twofold. One, because they uh, represent a clear and present dangers to, to, to public health. Uh, but even more that this has been uh, masked, underreported, and the, the uh, informed uh, information that's been pr- provided to people is too little too late. So right. if we could talk first about the Fukushima reactor leak in Japan, you have uh, focused on this for months, if not uh, years, on your uh, Full Spectrum Survivor channel, talking about uh, what we're not, what what the real uh, long-term and broad-scale impact is of that. But there are new developments in the last week that really uh, break that open. And if you could just give us a quick uh, rundown of what you think some of the most uh, important, what people need to know who want to be aware about the new developments with the Fukushima reactor leak. Absolutely. You know, it, like you said, it is not being talked about enough. The The reactor leak, the entire disaster that's going on in Fukushima is literally a population changing event, not an extinction level event as it stands right now, but a population changing event. And what I mean by that is that there is so much radiation that is being just f- freely flowed out into the into the ocean that it is now starting to affect the uh, oceanic wildlife is starting to affect uh, the tree growth in the areas, and it's starting. We're starting to see some of the long-term fallout from this disaster. So I would say, without a doubt, the Fukushima nuclear reactor mess is a long-duration emergency that each one of us need to put into our long-term preparedness plans and how to deal with that. And you know, I'm not one to drop any names, but if you go back over the guests, and you've been on my on my channel for the weekly live report where we go live, and we've had some big guests there too, just like you. And I had one recently. After the show, he said, Brad, I want you to tell me really, am I doing the right thing by changing my eating habits to avoid the potential uh, buildup of radiation from Fukushima. Without a doubt, it is my personal opinion, personal suggestion, that there is such an inundation of radiation going out into the ocean and just freely flowing back into the earth that it would behoove the individual that has the wherewithal and the forward thinking to start to alter their eating habits to definitely take it into consideration. Now, that brings about a lot of fatalism in people. And they say, well, if I can't, you know, if if I can't see it, I can't shoot it. If I, you know, they kind of pick an all or nothing. But you have to consider that it is literally changing the population on a genetic level. So what we're starting to see here is severe radiation damage on wildlife around Japan. And you would expect that because this is the worst nuclear disaster in history. So now we're starting to see this uh, concentric circle blow up. It's starting to expand and the visible effect is getting further and further away. And just to kind of bring it back to what's going on at Fukushima, they recently 
recorded 530 sieverts per hour. Now, this is the Tokyo Electric Power Company who has been behind the ball. They've been behind the curve in public disclosure, along with the Japanese government and really the governments of all of the world since the disaster struck. And I remember that very night when it was happening, it first started and they were saying, it's okay, it didn't reach the site. Then, okay, water came over the site, nothing was damaged. And then, okay, something was damaged, but there's no radiation leak. And it became this slow reveal of information so as not to shock the public. And what we're seeing today is just a continued slow reveal where you're not going to see exactly what is happening in the damage unless you've, A, researched it for yourself, or B, wait until the mainstream narrative picks up to a point where it's too late to do anything about it. That's the key that we wanted to touch on with you is when news comes uh, too little too late because there's a huge ulterior motive on the part of a, if it's in the case of a profit-making company to avoid commercial, uh, you know, distress and impact to their their profitability, if it's in the case of a government, it can be to quote-unquote avoid panic or or social disruption and and, uh, and rioting, looting, all kinds of disruptions. Um, But neither of those takes into account count the well-being of the population. That's right. Yeah, and that's right. And that's we have to kind of peel that layer back and see that to the governments of the world and to the elite that control within those governments of the world or outside of them, we are citizens to be governed. They are the government and we are to be governed. So we our job here is to pay your taxes, go to work and be happy. Those three main goals, that is all your government wants you to do. Pay your taxes, go to work, and continue to be happy. And if you look at the the facility of chemical pharmaceuticals and the facility of our society, it is all geared around those things. You go to the doctor and you tell them, I have something wrong, they fix you up enough that you can go to work. You go to the doctor and say, I'm depressed, they're going to give you antidepressants to be happy, all so that you can continue to go back to work. So you're absolutely right. It is about productivity. And at the end of the at the end of the day, a monetary involvement in that productivity. So I, I want to touch real quick on Fukushima. So 530 sieverts. At one sievert, if you or I, if a person is exposed to one sievert over the period of one hour, they're going to suffer radiation sickness and a genetic change within months. At five sieverts, they're going to die within one month. And at 10 sieverts, they're going to die within two to three weeks. And there are 530 sieverts continually, every hour of the day, nonstop, being released into the environment and into the ocean. That, to me, is an amazing number. And it's one that we all have to take into consideration and think what this is going to do for the generations of the Earth and how you and I can better prepare for this. And in that uh, vein of of uh, trying to, to be aware and to protect your family your yourself your family and your your loved ones the can you touch on the principle of if you wait till the final if you wait for the official warning it's too late that's right yeah absolutely if you wait until you're told that there's a disaster you are too late and that brings up something else that I want to talk with you about and that's the current ongoing Oroville dam spillover disaster so you have people that Like we said, the governments of the world, have, or at least the governments of California, have allowed to live far too close to the known spillover zone of uh, of the Oroville Dam. Now, 200,000 people were told last night that they need to get out of their homes and they need to do it so expeditiously that their life would be in danger if they didn't leave at that very moment. So. Future preparation is a huge point in making sure that each one of us has a go bag. And now you look at the go bags of the world and and you look at especially what the uh, official narrative for a go bag should be. And it, you know, it contains your marital documents and social security card and things like that, which aren't as necessary. You really need to facilitate the basics of survival in your go bag. So you need the ability to create fire because fire is going to purify your water warm your body so you don't go hypothermic, uh, create a smoke and signal so that you can get rescued or, or help rescue yourself. Uh, it's also going to ward off, um, you know, ward off wild animals, things like that. Then you need to, of course, have water and a way to purify it. I would suggest everybody listening, go to Walmart and buy a Sawyer mini water filter. It's $20. It fits in your backpack. 
and it will, it, I believe it's a, at around 100,000 gallons of water and just treat it right. If you're in freezing conditions, put it in your sleeping bag with you. So you've got the ability to create fire, some way to treat water, and then you need shelter. And a sill nylon tarp shelter, uh, you know, really anything that is easy so that you don't have to carry around a 30 pound tent with you, just something that you can have in that bag and set up to save your life and the lives of those you love. Again, uh, the principle here being that uh, people, this is a battle that that uh, preparedness minded individuals have to fight all the time is within their own mind and certainly getting the feedback from friends and neighbors, no matter how well intended and coworkers, but certainly from uh, watching and trusting the mainstream corporate media to be the source of indication for you when you really need to take action. Uh, all of those are going to put you at unnecessary risk. So what, uh, what alternate sources of inf- information do you recommend for people to keep tuned into since they know that they can't rely on any of those that are more culturally normal well the first i'd say is listen to the people that come on your show that is definitely going to keep people abreast of current uh alternative information and there is this huge push within not just the usg not not just the u.s government not just the western world but all of the governments of all of the world over to push a fake news agenda and what they're doing and, and i believe it was a princeton study if i remember right recently put uh, fake, fake information and then real information in front of people. And as long as they pushed out the fact that one of these two would be fake, it called into question the real information. So this is definitely a, a, a method of warfare and the psychological warfare game, game to control the mind of the individual so that they stop looking to alternative information and they stop thinking for themselves. And they focus just what on they know what they know could be true information, and that would be the mainstream narrative. So everybody listening needs to step back a moment and look outside that narrative and say, okay, where else can I gather information from? Of course, if you go to places like Press TV, uh, RT, they're going to have a narrative of their own. But what you need to do is to take into account all of these different battling agendas and make a good conscious decision and a moral decision that fits within your ideals and say, okay, I think this is the right direction because you're going to see this come into play the world over. You're going to see it during a pandemic, uh, during a regional disaster. You're going to see it during times of war. You're going to see this happen again and again, and you need to step back and look at all of the available information and then make a good decision based on yourself and like you said, your peers. If we could touch uh, for a moment on, you mentioned in passing earlier uh, about medical information that is being underreported or under or withheld. I have a personal story we were talking about just before uh, we started the broadcast because you asked how I was doing. One thing I wanted to reveal to our listeners is that uh, myself and my wife are being treated for uh, chronic Lyme's disease, which I contracted about seven years ago from a deer tick when playing paintball in the woods in Wisconsin. And... Uh, got immediate uh, classic textbook uh, symptoms on the surface, got immediate uh, medical, one round of antibiotics. And uh, because I woke up a few days later after the initial embedding of the, of the tick feeling like about a 90 year old man, I could, I had shaking fevers and uh, could hardly get out of bed. I was aching so badly, had zero energy, just total uh, lethargy and, uh, and profound fatigue Uh, with one round of antibiotics over a course of 10 days, I was, like bounced right back uh, and thought because I was told by the by the by what we call the conventional medical system that uh, I was cured. Right. Uh, however, we uh, about five years later, I started to develop a host of other symptoms such as heart palpitations and other uh, aches and pains that uh, and my, my wife started uh, getting uh, just inexplicable uh, skeletal muscular uh, pains and strains and fatigue and, and brain fog and memory loss. Both of us were affected that way. We got to an alternative uh, medical doctor who we've had on our on our show before and got some ed- consultic advice from our off-grid medical doctor, Jay Nielsen, who uh, found, gave us really an earful about what is not being reported about the rampant uh, under-reporting of the prevalence of Lyme's disease uh, nationally and more, um, I, you know, more from a... Uh, 
conspiracy uh, as far as containing the the news is that the new v- more virulent strain of limes that's being seen in the wild now uh, was not seen prior to the return of our desert shield vets where there is at least a pro- there is evidence to suggest that there was actually a weaponized version of some uh, diseases that were attempted to be employed, that were developed in the U.S., tried to be used in Operation Desert Shield. When the vets, some of them uh, got inadvertently, uh, unintentionally exposed to that, brought it back home, uh, then in, bitten by ticks, and now it's in the wild. And so you have basically this weaponized version of limes that's being completely denied by the, the mainstream medical community, and it's a very uh, intensive uh, a five, excuse me, eight to nine month uh, course of intermittent uh, treatments. And if you look up Herxheimer reaction and also uh, bioslime sequestration about how this these new, more virulent uh, forms of these spirochetes are able to hide between your cells in your body and hide up against bony mm-hmm. surfaces and cover yeah. themselves with bioslime to, so they're invisible to your immune system while they replicate and then burst out and, and affect. And then when you actually do use a spe- some special enzymes to dissolve the bioslime and then some sp- special intermittent bursts of, of combinations of antibiotics of increasing strength to uh, attack them, kind of sneak attack, you you get these uh, die-offs, and it's the toxicity from the die-offs of the effective treatment that makes you feel like you're back on death's doorstep again. So anyway, just to say that you, if you, you, there are there are like three paths. You you'll either hear that from the mainstream uh, medical establishment that that either Lyme's is not that that big of a deal if it's treated early and treated right. once, or secondly, you'll hear it is incurable uh, from some people that have later information, or you'll hear this third path, which is, no, it can be managed, but you've got to do it in a very uh, informed and aware way. So once again, if you if you wait around to be, to be, in, to be uh, told this by your uh, family doctor who may be totally unaware of this, uh, you're really uh, battling without full information. You can't be uh, prepared if you're not aware of of what the, what you're up really up against so just well, in yeah, that you're absolutely you're go ahead right now i've seen i've seen some white papers on the change to biofilms just like you were saying you know biofilms are a really dangerous uh disease transmission form and you know legionella's bacteria legionella pneumophilia that is driven through biofilms and so you're right in that there there is a change going on in the natural world and in the way that humans interact with it and i i have to go back to very informed discussions between virologists and disease experts of the world who have said plainly, and this is just from a mathematical and a a, a visible look at the world, that humanity's reign on health is coming to an end. And it has to come to an end because the world is starting to take back. So like you, you know, when you brought up the, the conspiratorial side of things, that got me thinking because who benefits from what used to be a single regimen of chemical pharmaceutical now to an eight month or maybe even perpetual right. re- uh, regimen of it who benefits from that well and there's Only also the chemical there's also the denial of uh, and, and the fear of liability. We've certainly heard that in the past about, you know, uh, mercury and dental fillings being told, no, 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 it's not a problem, not a problem, or right. fluoride, fluoride in the water, not a problem, not a problem, or uh, childhood immunizations, uh, any any ca- causal link with, you know, uh, from pertussis vaccine to autism, no, 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 not a problem, not a problem. So if you look at any of those and say, is there a conflict of interest here? You bet there is, and that's yeah, another reason. Absolutely right. Yeah. So if we could uh, jump forward to a, maybe a more positive uh, <laughs> outlook is, could you give us a few uh, key takeaways, some of the high points from your uh, weekend? Uh, first, describe what, what it was that, uh, you were, that you were involved in over this weekend and, and any big high points you could share with our audience. Absolutely. And first, if you don't mind me jumping back for just one Absolutely. second, so at the beginning of the show, I started talking about a, a guest on the weekly live report who had said, am I doing the right thing? And they were looking after ways to uh, cleanse their body from radiation because they live on the West Coast of the United States. So sure. they're a lot closer to the problem than I am. Now, during the Chernobyl accident, the children of Chernobyl were given fruit pectin, 100 percent pectin in a reg a daily regimen and the, what the pectin does is it actually pulls through your organs and through your entire body radiation and heavy metals and dispenses it through your urine 
So if anybody right now, and, and I, the reason I brought this up is because you said uh, immunizations and vaccine schedules. Yeah, yeah. I, I get asked that all the time. I already, my kids already had vaccines and I'm kind of seeing this problem. What can I do? And I would say 100% of the time, you're going to see an improvement that cannot hurt if you try a pectin regimen. And that's the same exact pectin that you go to the store and you can your goods with that for your preserving your goods. And just start on a regimen of that. There's plenty of information, plenty of white papers that have been done. If you go look, if you research Chernobyl pectin, you're going to find the white papers that were done uh, by the World Health Organization and multinational organizations that saw a, I believe it was like an 80% reduction in radiation levels in the children of Chernobyl. And just think of how that can apply to our everyday lives and how we're taking metals in all over the place. And uh, uh, anything so, else as far as uh, food choices? Like what about uh, Pacific uh, fish, from fish from the Pacific Ocean, whether it's shellfish or crabs or, 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 or normal ocean fish? It, it is wholeheartedly off my plate. And I'll, I'll go as far as to say no California oranges on mine, no Washington apples, and no, uh, no cheese from California. And that's, that's, again, just my personal preference, personal opinion, because I see the damage that is being wrought that much closer to Fukushima. So I have just stepped back and all we can all do, the only thing that each one of us can do is mitigate the damage from it. And I would rather mitigate than do nothing at all. A recurring guest on our program, um, Joel Salatin, the founder of co-founder of Polyface Farms in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, or what we call our activist farmer, who we have on the show, uh, talks in about a week ago, we had him on and he was talking about uh, local food to the rescue. So again, as you point out, you do not need to, even though it's the uh, the supply chain currently and the mass market uh, sources that we have most right. readily available uh, would would trap us into bring you know taking in remotely brought in uh, supplies that we have no idea you know, how uh, how clean those sources were but we can uh, look for local alternatives uh, that would help us have better integrity on our food. That's right. Absolutely. Um, okay. So back to your other yeah. uh, discussion. So a couple of times a year, we'll do survival and preparedness retreats and courses with people. And we actually have another one coming up in June. It's called the Homestead Event. Uh, so anybody wants to look, they can go to the homesteadevent.com. They're going to see information about it. What we do is we bring course instructors in and we go over four days all of the courses and physical real life information that a person is going to need to survive a disaster or to thrive on a homestead. So we're going over everything from uh, personal survival, wilderness survival, uh, right down from a primitive level up to modern wilderness survival, personal preparedness, how to plan for your family. And what we'll actually do is set sit down with each person and do a one year plan with them and get them on online so that they can actually take that next step and have a one-year box or a one-year plan in their house should anything happen economically or geopolitically. Uh, and this goes all the way through to aquaponics, uh, cob building, building with cob, um, canning your food, trapping animals. And it's not just watching something on, on YouTube or uh, you know hearing about from someone Everybody gets out and physically does it because until you put one of those conibear traps, until you feel the tension on that conibear trap, you're not going to know how lethal it is and yeah. you're not going to respect it as much. Just like, as you know, with a firearm, with firearms training, until you start pulling the trigger yeah. and especially trying to hit a moving object, you don't have that respect for it. Right. And so uh, we work with, go ahead. I was just going to say that we had just recently had, um, uh, one of our survival outdoor survival experts on uh, Jay Wayne Fears, and he stressed also that if you need to be able to live on wild edibles, for example, you best get uh, direct hands-on instruction from somebody who's knowledgeable about your local area and what options are available there, not just to pick up a book and think that you can do it on your own. That gets back to that uh, hands-on experiential learning that you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. You know, because the difference, and admittedly so from my standpoint, it is... 110% easier to start a fire on a dry, warm day than it is on a cold, wet, and humid day. It, it's just a world of difference. And the fact of the matter is you need that fire 
more on a cold, wet, and humid day yeah. than you do on the dry day. Yeah, yeah. windy too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's right. So, so actually getting your hands dirty. And, you know, we're doing it on a couple of pieces of property here in Wadawi, Alabama. And the people are going to come sleep under the stars with us. We're all going to sleep out. It's going to be, a, you know, like a primitive camping arrangement. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I hope if, if you're free, Duncan, I hope you're able to you know, make it out there with us, or at least, you know, we'll find some way to correlate that information back to you because it is so much information that I, I can't express enough the need for people to actually get their hands dirty. And, you know, we're going to be butchering animals there that we trap and catch, Okay, uh, going out, you know, doing the hunting, building the fires, cooking the food. We have wild edibles instructors there that know the entire United States and are actually going to walk people through the forest and say, okay, let's all pick that up and eat it, and let's process that this way. And that's a, you know, no, that's a, uh, a dangerous lookalike. And so, like you said, it's really that hands-on information that you need to be able to learn the difference between what will save your life and the knowledge that we all carried, you know, in the backs of our head. So, if anyone listening is interested, I, I urge you to go to thehomesteadevent.com, see which course speakers are going to be there, and see if it's something that interests you. And now bringing it right back to home uh, for your own family. You just did a, a wholesale pull up stakes and move from an urban environment where you used to talk about urban exit strategies and all that sort of thing to a homestead. So uh, right. I know it's early in the process, but can you give us uh, kind of a few key points about that? First of all, what were your strategic search criteria that you employed when trying to, de to resolve on the ideal location for your homestead? I guess the first thing that I would want to say, the first, even further back than that, at the base reasoning is that we are reaching a time in our earth where crisis events are happening so with such frequency and with the potential for large scale disasters to happen like the H5N9 or other variation of the, of the avian influenza virus becoming pandemic, becoming a pandemic. You know, there's just so there's a swath of things that can cause each one of us to pull back to our survival and preparedness training at any moment. And I was in a city, a county of 900,000 people. And now I'm in a county of 9,000 people. <laughs> so, so it is an immense difference. But like you said, why did I do that? Because if a disaster happens, and this has, there's a, a multifaceted road here. One, the CDC was just giving sweeping new powers by the current administration to close down major freeways, quarantine individuals without their consent, quarantine minors without the consent or even acknowledgement of the parents, and to really do whatever is necessary on a governmental level to contain an outbreak. And this is an outbreak on any biological front, whether it's man-made or uh, you know naturally spread. So that, of course, piques my ear. Uh, the ongoing disaster at Fukushima piques my ear, knowing that Fukushima is just one nuclear reactor. And how many are there? There's, you know, how close was I to them? How close was my family to right. them? Um, another thing is just getting back to the roots of what I believe we are, as humans, we're put here to do. So whereas the government looks at each one of us and wants us to be happy, pay our taxes and go to work. I think us as humans, we were, we're on this earth to live life on this earth and, and through it and connecting to it as much as possible. And that for me means a homestead environment. So to go back to your question on, on sort of those stepping blocks of what got us here, the first thing is community. And I just kind of let it out into existence that this was the direction that we were going to go. Because I'll tell you honestly, my wife and I don't have the credit. We have no credit. So we don't have the credit that we could go, you know, pick up a 60000 or or $100,000 loan and just go figure it out down the road. So it was something that a, a lot of the listeners are probably forced into the same situation that you have to consider every direction that you take. And our direction was to kind of just get it out there that we were looking for this. And we found a great community uh, with another YouTuber here in Alabama. His name's uh, Daniel Smith, Go for Green Living, does aquaponics, greenhouses, things like that. He said, hey, well, why don't you come, uh, you know, come stay here for a little bit, uh, help out on the homestead, 
And then there's there's property all over the place here because there's no one around and no one wants to live where no one's around. Now that for me piqued my interest because yeah. I want to live where no one else That's is. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, my wife and I were looking actually at some maps last night and found uh, educating ourselves on the ratio between population and area of different states. Uh, Wyoming has been piquing our interest for several reasons. And uh, on there, it says it is the uh, ninth largest state and 50th in terms of population of among all states. Okay, yeah. And it's those types of things where we looked into the local population. Of course, in our modern day, I wanted to look into crime rate, things like that, and just make sure that it was a good decision for my family and my children. Um, looked into the area, made some calls, and then just took a, a leap of faith and said, okay, let's, let's do it. Got up here, and not a month later, we are now talking with a, a landowner right next door here who wants to get rid of his property for a very inexpensive amount. And I'm talking in the low thousands of dollars. Wow. And this is for a couple of acres here. And he has multiples around. And that to me says, okay, well, that's very doable. Yeah. Um, it's amazing when you're anticipating a uh, change that if you wait for all the stoplights to turn green before you make your move, you miss out on the opportunity to open that first door and it leads to a hallway of new doors you never would have found and never would have seen. You cannot uh, underestimate the expansive uh, power of taking action and making that initial right. step. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so here at this homestead where we're at right now, while we're negotiating that, that piece of land, we're completely off the grid. He uh, runs solely on solar power. Um, and I'm talking everything, the the 100 foot greenhouse, the aquaponics bed where we just go in there and you pull out three to four pound tilapia that are then in turn feeding the nutrients to the plant, which are thriving in the greenhouse. Wow. Um, so it, it's really a great hands-on thing for me to see because I'd never done aquaponics before. And, and to see that actual cycle of life, that, that sort of food forest in that greenhouse setting was really an amazing thing. And, you know, but like you said, to just pick up your stuff and go, it takes a leap of faith. And to know that just like during the disaster, my wife and children and I would be fine we're, we'll kind of be fine no matter where we go. So it gave us the, uh, the heart to just get up and do it. And it was that you, you had put out uh, the interest. You let people know in the preparedness community that you were interested in that. What it sounds like there was a trigger there when you got a response saying, "Hey, look, there's this opportunity here. Uh, why don't you come?" Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and and not just one, multiple responses. Uh -huh. And so you know, and I think everyone will find that. And you know, within our community of prepared-minded people, uh, survivalists and preppers, you know, there's a tendency to remain closed in because operational security says if anyone has my information or knows my information, there's a chance for it to be abused. Right. So that tendency to remain closed in keeps a lot of us from that open community. But I would I would venture to say make good close friends within that community and just put it out there. If you see someone who always makes comments like you do um, or always, you know, is is talking about a certain website or listening to a certain type of information, make small talk with them and then take that next step. And you're not going to find that everyone falls in line with what you what you want out of life. But you will find some that do and then build that community no matter where you're at right now. And, and I'll tell you, I'll have I'll have single mothers come to me and say my husband. Well, they're newly single or potentially single nearby. They'll say my husband is doesn't like preparedness. He thinks I'm crazy and I have to protect my children in the event of a disaster. And let me tell you, that is the survival instinct that has gotten us as humans through thousands, tens of thousands of years of hardship. And you, it's just being washed away because of a dependency on government. So as you see other people who have this same mindset, right. grab onto it and talk to them. Right. I was just, just saw a television advertisement tonight for, saw, I, was, I believe it was a Ford, it was a self-parking car. And uh, I just <laughs> thought, yeah, it really seems handy. And I thought, wait a minute. When I was a kid, my dad taught me how to do everything on our car. I knew how to not only change the oil and tires, I knew how to change out engines, transmissions, everything. Uh, now, they reach a point where all the electronics and everything on the car where people feel like, I, I'm not qualified. I don't have the computerized equipment. There's nothing I can do uh, on my own car. And now, we're not even going to be qualified to drive our own cars. So the, right. with, with that increased convenience comes this increased helplessness, rather than what you're saying is get back to basics and reclaim your competence, your ability to make, you know, provide and keep your family safe and trust your instincts. 
That's right. And, and get the get through those things now before a disaster strikes. Learn what gear is going to fail. Uh, you know, we uh, let me tell you. So from the climate change from Florida, Tampa, Florida, to this area of Randolph County, Alabama, it is a, a drastic change. We're upwards of thirty four hundred feet above sea level. Uh, suffered some, you know, we would suffer one or two cold nights in Florida where it's going to get down in the in the twenties. But here, weeks at a you know a week stench at a time, and had I not been of a preparedness mind, I wouldn't have had the army bivy bags, the you know the negative sleeping bags, and would have been much less prepared to put my family into a position where everyone has the potential to get cold, you know, catch pneumonia, things like that. No, we just walked in and it was just like an extended camping trip. <laughs> so in your case, and in, that's what you're pointing out, is that preparedness actually provides you with options. Options provide you with freedom to take choices you couldn't otherwise take. That's right. Well, Brad Harris, founder of FullSpectrumSurvival.com, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else here you want to uh, share with our audience before we wrap this tonight? Uh, I would say, you know, I, I'd love to come back on soon, talk about perpetual servitude and the uh, what the government really is looking for from us. There's some new information about disease super spreaders and how those will play a part in biological outbreaks. Uh, and we could really talk all day about the avian influenza virus and how it continues to jump from animals to humans over and over again, so much that this is the worst it has been on record in China, where we have like 357 human cases, small clusters of transmission between humans of the avian influenza virus with a 30 to 50 percent fatality rate so that is that's huge and right back at the beginning of the show we talked about the news you're not being told that's right and that's one of that's one of them so you know i'd love to come back on soon talk about that if your guests want to hear it please if they want to know something just reach out and ask um they can email me full spectrum survival at gmail.com and if they have the four days in june to come out to the homestead event it's the homestead event.com. We're going to sleep under the stars together, learn how to survive a disaster and prepare for the unknowns of tomorrow. Well, Brad, thank you again for being here on reluctant preppers and anybody who's interested in that, uh, that homestead event, go to homestead event.com and check it out. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. 